Okay. <ríe> Gracias. Oye, ¿cómo están todos? Qué bueno. Qué bueno verlo. Bien, bien. ¿Cómo están las cosas ahí en la Hawaii? So can, you, can you see the screen? Ya, yeah, ya. Yeah. And your mouse. Okay. Great. Okay. Okay. So you let me know, Felipe. Uh, shall I start right away or you want to wait let a few me, minutes? Let me make a introduction. Okay. So thank you everyone for being here. Wow. <laughs> we have like our third or fourth uh, journal club online. And this time we have Professor Francisco Roja from Universidad Adolfo Ibáñez. And he's going to talk about celestial amplitude and flat space holography. So, Pancho, you have around 45 minutes plus questions. Yeah, please go ahead. All right. Uh, I cannot. I don't know why I cannot go back. Let me just, sorry about this. Okay, okay, there we go. All right, so uh, thank you very much, Felipe, for the invitation. Um, so today I'm going to talk about this um, kind of new field. I mean, it, it's been already like four years. Uh, so it's not that recent anymore, but, but okay, but it's fairly recent. Um, so this is uh, based on, on, on work that uh, we've done with uh, Hernan Gonzalez, uh, Andrea Pum, also uh, another work that we did this year with Hernan and some work in progress with Hernan also and Horacio Nastas. So, um, so let me give you just a quick motivation of, of, of what I mean with all this. Um, so when you have a scattering amplitude, so you prepare, I mean, the, the, the process goes like this, right? You prepare some uh, initial state at uh, T minus infinity and far away. Um, that far away could be either, you know, uh, um, space-like uh, infinity or null infinity if you're talking about massless particles. So I'm going to focus in this talk in, in massless particles in, in, in a few minutes. But in general, of course, you, had, you just prepare this state at, at, at t minus infinity and, and far away. The same thing with, with our um, state, okay? So, um, so what is the S matrix? The S matrix is just simply this evolution operator that brings this in state, evolves through time, has all the information about the scattering process, evolves also, evolves at you know, through, uh, through the future. And then at the future, you just, you know, compute the amplitude of this, of, of starting with this end state, having all the scattering process, you come out with some out state. And this is, of course, what we call the scattering amplitude. So, so the basic object, of course, is the S matrix, which is the one that has all the information about the interactions at, you know, full quantum level um, of, of, of the process. All right. So, um, so no, notice that um, because of this asymptotic, uh, remember what I say here. So this is a free asymptotic state, and this is also a free asymptotic state. Um, so these states, of course, are are completely are not interacting. Okay. So um, because they are already free. Um, so and they're defined at infinity. So notice that tautologically, the S matrix is holographic in nature. Okay, but uh, what would really would regard this to be holographic, if not for a few details. Um, uh, for example, when you, when you have a scattering of gravity, so when you're doing quantum gravity at the level of, of the scattering in processes, the S matrix actually is the, I mean, is the only non-observable you have in asymptotically flat space. Of course, in ADS, you, you know, we, there's a different story, but this talk was about holography in flat space. So in flat space, this is the only known observable that we have in quantum gravity. So we should really take it seriously uh, um, in terms of, you know, extracting as much in, as much as possible information uh, you can get out of it. Um, Sorry, Francisco, one question. So yes. you, you mean that uh, it is tautologically holographic because it is asymptotically defined, but 
holography yeah. is not only about the yes. like yes. something being defined at the, at the boundary it is also yes. about having one dimension less right yes yes exactly yeah so and, and the boundary here is actually 2d in the case of massless particles where i'm going to talk about this celestial sphere which is a 2d um sphere so in, in that sense it's also holographic right no, 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 okay, I understand that, but wh why do you mean that the S matrix in general is tautologically holographic? It is asymptotic in the sense that you're defining uh, an in-out uh, dot product, like you're taking in states and, and uh, right. propagating them into out states, but yes. the in Hilbert space and the out Hilbert space are the Hilbert space in the asymptotic region, but they're not holographic because they don't have one dimension less like they, they don't have one spatial coordinate less in, in general, or, or I'm misunderstanding some. In general, I mean, you're right. In general, no, but I will focus my attention on massless particles. So, so massless particles, you know, photons, I, I have one more slide about, about this, but let, let me just, you know, uh, say a few words before that. So massless, this is a Penrose diagram so, of, of flat space, right? So photons, you know, gluons, gravitons, all those massless particles, they, they, the in state is defined as scribe minus, right? Yes. So they, they, they evolve, you know, they travel, there's some scattering process that happens, you know, at the center of your coordinate system, and then they fly off to, I mean, out, out to um, plus, I mean, I scribe plus, right? Mm -hmm. So, and, and this surface here actually has no notion of time also. Right and 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 particles reach the celestial sphere, which is essentially two dimensional. Yes. So in that right. in that in, in that sense, you you do have less a uh, uh, you know a uh, 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 a description. I mean, the S matrix is a description for matchless states, at least in terms yes. of a uh, lower dimensional theory or lower okay. dimensional framework. All right. Thank you. Okay. So, um, so yeah, the discussion is, is uh, actually Ignacio pointed out in the right direction already that, that, so it is then natural to look for some holographic description of the S matrix at the boundaries. Again, nobody would have taken this seriously, you know, some uh, long time ago because of exactly what I I Ignacio was pointing out. I mean, it's just something which is, Asymptotically, but so so what? I mean, there are many things that you can define at infinity, um, and so that is not much of a big surprise. But you know, there there are hints that when gravity is involved, um, you should really look for something you know that it's hidden. And I will show you that there was something that was overlooked for many many years. Uh, uh, especially when you when you include gravity in in, in this in, in, in all this um, picture. All right. Um, so I will go back to this diagram uh, a, a little bit. No sé por qué de repente se queda pegado. Okay. There we go. So uh, let me say some more comments. Uh, so in ADS, the boundary is actually Lorentzian. So you have the usual notions of locality and time evolution and even causality. So defining a local QFT at the boundary is actually a very good candidate for a holographic theory because you can describe you know, all the time evolution and unitarity of the bulk theory in four dimensions in terms of another, uh, another theory with all, which also has all this you know, well-defined notions of locality and time evolution at the boundary of a space. Now, in Minkowski space or asymptotically flat space, we don't have this luxury. So um, one main question that has remained actually from the original S matrix program, which is people now call it the bootstrap, but uh, it's just the, 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 the original S matrix program from the 60s, from 1960, is how, for example, things like causality or locality are imprinted in the analytic structure of the S matrix. So the S matrix at the end of the day, uh, when you read all the textbooks, uh, you see it's of course, it's an object which is defined in, in momentum space, all the momentum uh, invariance, the, the Mandelstam invariance, for example, all the Lorentz, Lorentz invariant quantities that you can form out of all the external momenta, um, you, uh, regard them as a, a complex number, and then you have a full analytic 
uh, function or it's a meromorphic function, but you, you have an, an analytic structure of this S matrix uh, in, 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 in the complex plane. But 70 years have passed and nobody really knows yet how causality, something as, you know, as uh, profound as causality um, is, um, is imprinted in, in this analytic structure. So this is still an open problem. Uh, and, and the same thing also for unitarity, as I just said, in quantum mechanical locality, how usually you take it as you take them as granted. You just start from a theory in, in, in the bulk. You have a four dimensional theory and you start with the principle of quantum mechanics. You start with unitarity and also you start you start with a Lagrangian, which is local. Or if you don't want to use a Lagrangian, you anyhow you build a, a, a nest matrix, you know, some a scattering amplitudes, which has built in locality. But there is a sense in that nowadays that maybe unitarity and locality should emerge from some deeper uh, theory or some from some deeper principles. And we still do not know that yet. So, um, so yeah, th th those are some comments that I wanted to make. And let me just end up with the final comment about this, saying that actually we need new physical principles or maybe mathematical structures to directly determine the S matrix from maybe some boundary theory, okay? Um, I, I, I added a few more comments here that, um, for example, the S matrix carries valuable information in uh, for black hole physics. So for example, this is the old thing from the 1990s, Toft uh, S matrix approach to quantum black holes. Uh, we also had this Hawking's original, you know, uh, donor uh, or the non, S matrix proposal in which he was trying to since, since information seemed to be lost when you when you form a you know, all this scattering process and when you form a black hole so all this information in the in states disappears apparently uh, because of the final Hawking radiation has no information about you know when when end so Hawking tried to develop this uh, non S matrix uh, proposal in order to deal with this uh, information paradox. Uh, and more recently from uh, 2015, if I remember correctly, uh, we have this, uh, th there is this um, um, proposal by Polshinsky about the chaos in the black hole haze matrix. So uh, there, were, there, there were all these developments uh, about, you know, bound, of, bound on chaos by uh, Schenker, Stanford, and, and what was it, who was? Maldacena, yeah, more Maldacena. Maldacena, Saskin, and uh, Maldacena, Stanford, and, and, and Schenker where they found this, you know, bound on chaos uh, for, uh, for black holes. And then right away, Polchinski came up with this, you know, how to, how to do this or how to see this at the level of the, of the black hole S matrix. So, so the S matrix seems to be a, a very powerful and, and deep object. And there are many things about it that we don't know yet. So, um, so I said that I was going to focus uh, on, on, on mathless scattering. So I could have a scattering in QED. I'm not saying that we have some unrealistic uh, theory. I'm, for example, in QED, you have electrons, which are, of course, uh, massive, but you have photons, which are massless. And in the scattering processes, you can see, you know, of course, the, the light come out and, and, and you have a perfectly well-defined uh, amplitude uh, of the real world with massless um, states uh, at infinity. So, um, so th this is the basic picture. Um, um, as I said before, you have some, some let me write that. So have, you have some in state, you have many, 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 or you know, some, um, uh, your favorite number of, of, of photons or gluons or gravitons that then are going to scatter. And then the, uh, the uh, you know, uh, the, the outcome of that experiment, it'll be some out state that is going to fly out to um, future null infinity. All right, okay, so, so the, Okay, that's it. So let me just, uh, this is what I already had before. So, um, okay, so we talked about that already. So uh, um, let me tell you that the in and out states for the case of null particles, massless particles, they actually live on the celestial sphere. So let me go ahead now and, and, and talk about what, what the celestial sphere uh, is. Um, I, of course, this is something that, that many of you know, but let me just give a quick introduction. 
Um, uh, before going to that, let me just say, so what is the basic idea? So we have, we have this process that happens, you know, uh, um, uh, for example, this is a, a, a two to two scattering. This is a four point amp where you have some, some um, massless states, photons, for example, they scatter something, you know, uh, completely arbitrary happens, you know, it could be an amplitude three level, loop level, for example, this is a three loop amplitude, uh, just, just for fun. And, and then, and then, you know, this uh, this is what we call the celestial sphere. So it's basically, you know, when you look at the sky, it's just the same celestial sphere that you're used to, you know, in, in, in astronomy. Um, yeah, you take a snapshot of the sky, and then, for example, the, the star themselves are, are a very good approximation of what this celestial sphere is. You know, they you take a snapshot, and then you have this light rate that come from different directions, and they form this sphere um, in, at the sky. Right, so uh, as I said before, well, of course, this in-state is defined as chi minus and out-state is defined on, on square plus. Uh, so, so the basic idea of this program is that um, we want to find a way to, uh, to describe the 4D ball theory in terms of a two-dimensional theory defined on the celestial sphere. So, um, so yeah, so in that sense, it's, it's really holographic, right? You, you, um, it's not even one dimension less, you have two dimensions less in, in this case. <clears throat> so what is the celestial sphere? Uh, you know, as, as, as we, uh, we already mentioned, uh, it's just, you know, this, this thing that you see at the night sky, and then uh, you can think of it in the other way around. You have some scattering processes, process happen, you know, happening, at uh, you know the origin of your coordinate system, and then you have these particles that that you know fly away, and and if they are massless particles, they pierce, they pierce, you know, they they leave a puncture on 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 the celestial sphere at null infinity, okay, um, because this go to null infinity, so they, these are supposed to be massless. So let me just uh, say uh, one thing about massive particles: it's uh, instead of instead of the particles reaching you know uh, null infinity they actually reach you know um, a time like infinity and so the manifold there is not uh it's not a two-dimensional manifold it's actually a three-dimensional manifold that instead of being a sphere it's an, an hyperboloid so um people call this you know the celestial hyperboloid and and and, and defining bulk you know massive particles uh, or amplitudes uh in terms of this three-dimensional celestial hyperboloid, hyperboloid is also something that, you, you know, um, 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 it's important to, to do, but so far um, people have focused on mass, massless states only because it's, they're easier to treat. So this massive, this massive um, part is uh, still mostly unexplored. Uh, so there's a lot of work to do in, the, in, in that sense as well. So um, now the question is, okay, we, we were hoping that we have this boundary theory. So what kind of boundary theory are we expecting? So um, we have a hint, we have a hint, for example, just like in ADCFT, we, uh, there was this hint uh, about, you know, the asymptotic symmetries the, or the asymptotic isometries of, I mean, or, or the, the isometries of ADS5, for example, matches the conformal group in four dimensions. Um, so um, we could do the same, the same, uh, we can play the same game. game. So we have, in, in flat space, of course, we have uh, the Lorentz group, and we know of this um, isomorphism with SL2C, well, uh, modded out by, by Z2, uh, but um, I, I will not worry about this Z2 so much. Um, so uh, we could start from there. And um, so now we ask the question, okay, this is just, okay, this is an isomorphism and, and you can see it you know, in many ways, uh, but exactly in terms of space and geometry, how do you see it explicitly? And this is how the celestial sphere actually arises. So uh, for example, instead of, uh, it, this is a, a more convenient set of coordinates, instead of using um, you know, the usual Cartesian coordinates, uh, let's use this Bondi coordinates. Um, and also, uh, instead of using, you know, just the regular angles, uh, phi and theta, you know, just the Hasimoto, you know, typical three-dimensional angles, uh, we're going to use this complex, um, this complex number z, which is defined this way, and then this is this is what you get. Okay. So 
So now um, you could ask um, a basic question. So, okay, so I know exactly how Lorentz transformations look like in, 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 in this system. How do they look like in, the, in, this, in, in this new, um, I mean, not new, but in, the, in, in this set of coordinates? So you could start from that. For example, I have a Poincare, you know, a Lorentz transformation in, in, in some translation, for example. Uh, so, for example, let me focus on the case of Z. So, when this is Z prime, uh, this is supposed to look like this. And now I, I make a transformation for each of these uh, axes, and then it looks horrible. So, it, it, it looks really, really, really horrible. Uh, and there's more terms here that I did not put. But the nice thing is that at large R, so you take the R going to infinity limit, so you, when, and, 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 and also you go to null infinity. Um, you get this. So the transformation of the Z coordinate is exactly an SL2C transformation, okay? And you have more terms like here, like one over R, okay? And also here, uh, we use the fact that we are, you know, on null infinity. So this is exactly how you see this, you know, this, isomorph this isomorphism um, at, at the level of just, you know, geometrical transformations. Okay? I'm not saying anything, you know, deep, of course, it's, it's, it's just, you know, some observation that, uh, it's good to to have in mind. Okay. Um, and so let me let me remind you that SL to C, you know, the Moebius uh, group is actually the group of conformal transformations on the two sphere. And what two sphere? Well, this is exactly the celestial sphere because we are R away in R. And also, uh, um, I, I did not say it here, but we are constraining ourselves to be on, on the null, on the null surface. All right. Okay. So um, now that we have this, how much time? Okay. So now that we have uh, this idea. Um, so scattering amplitudes, of course, uh, um, it's a function, as we said before, it's a function of the incoming and outgoing momenta of all the external particles. So, um, so um, uh, let me choose a convenient parameterization for the, uh, for the momentum of each particle. Here you should, you should think of this, you know, uh, this parameterization for each of the external states in this scattering process. And, 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 and this parameterization is very convenient. And this is exactly the same Z of, of the celestial sphere. All right, so um, um, you can check directly here that this of course is a, is a, null, is a null vector because we're focused on, on, on null particles. And, and notice that, that, well, of course, this Zs are dimensionless quantities. So uh, omega, which is outside, um, actually is the, uh, is the energy of the particle. But this is a weird, you know, it's a different, Parametrization usually, you know, the energy of a particle is just, you know, the zero component, and but here the zero component is mixed with, the, uh, you know, I mean the zero, the, the energy or the zero component has energy and also angle dependence. So it's weird, but but it's very very convenient uh, when you describe this uh, um, processes on the celestial sphere. All right, um, so um, and omega, it's, as, as I said, is the energy, so it goes from zero to infinity. Let me also say something that. Uh, if you want to study amplitudes um, for even massive states, but if you're if you're interested in the high, very high energy limit uh, and of, of 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 these particles, so when these particles are very energetic, they have an energy much larger than their best mass, and you see here that of course the the, um, the um, spatial momenta is basically is basically the energy of the particles. So again get that uh, p mu p mu is approximately zero. So you can also think of it, think of, 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 of these particles reaching null infinity, not only for massless particles, but you could think of them as you know, massive particles in, in the very high energy regime. I will say a few things about the high energy limit when we talk about um, um, uh, graviton scattering and also uh, black, hole, black hole scattering. Okay, so um, so usually, um, so let me talk about this thing which which are called boost eigenstate. So usually, what 
do we do when we have uh, a scattering process? So we have this in state and we have the out states and, and you define these external states as just free particles, it's just the plane wave um, um, that has dependence on momenta like this. Let me remind you that we decided to use this parameterization in which the momenta is labeled by its energy omega, and this points on, 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 on the celestial sphere. But by the way, this Z actually is not a real puncture on the sphere, it's, you know, it's the stereographic projection on the sphere, of the sphere onto the complex plane. So, so, so Z actually lives, you know, in a flat, you know, in, in, in a flat plane. All right. So, um, so um, we're still in, using this momentum eigenstate, just plane waves. But now we define a new object. So we're going to define this new object, which is called boost eigenstate. It's called boost eigenstate because actually you are you are you are summing up, you know, a, a, this 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 states, you know, to all energies from zero to infinity. So it's, it's kind of just you're boosting this state in some direction because in that direction is fixed by by z. So it's it's like it's really like a like like uh, adding up all the uh, boost uh, boosted um, um, momentum states, and, um, and 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 you sum over this with some specific factor here, and 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 the and the reason of this will become uh, clearer um, in, in a few more minutes. But this is by definition what it's called the Mellin transform of this of this function of omega here. All right. By the way, are, are there any questions? Am I going too slow or too fast? I, I have a question about this last point of choosing this uh, this uh, basis. Uh, yes. the, this basis of uh, like Mellin states or boost eigenstates uh, is it similar to the thing that you do, for instance, when you change from uh, momentum eigenstates to the Rindler eigenstates in the Rindler basis, like when you study kind of like uh, the usual UNRU radiation, stuff like that, because it is kind of reminiscent of that. Um, it kind of is, right? But in the Rindler, in the Rindler picture, you don't integrate over the energies, right? Or you do? Uh, I mean, you define okay, right? You you, you define this uh, Rindler time and and yeah. the, but the but the like the the eigenstate. I mean the 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 eigen like the 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 quantum number right that characterizes uh, like the the magnitude of the momentum in the in the Rindler basis. Uh, well, like it's kind of like the 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 Rindler momentum that would be measured by a Rindler observer. I think it is kind of like this uh, omega. Not entirely sure, maybe. But, but but then, do you integrate over omega in that case also, or no? Um, uh, I don't think so, right? It's, it's a still fixed energy. It's just it's just a different slicing, right? Yeah, it, it is fixed energy, but but then when when you want to compute, for instance, the like you, you want to compute uh, how does the like the, the vacuum look in Rindler coordinates, you get like a sum yeah, yeah, yeah. over over all, all energies, right? That, that's actually what gives you the like the thermal spectrum in a way. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, the vacuum is kind of like this. Yeah. I, yeah, yeah I, I don't I don't have a a clear cut, you know, answer, but that's a very good question. Um, yeah, okay, I, I can Think about it also, but okay. So it's you're just doing a change of basis basically, but it is because uh, I mean, what what is the this eigen value that you're defining? This delta, like it would correspond to to the measure to the result of a measurement, right? This is what you want to to choose this other basis, right? Yeah. Well, you yeah. In, in the next slide, you will see that it will become a conformal. I mean, a, a scaling dimension on the on uh -huh. the CFD. Okay. Right. This is this so, is what it will do. Yes. 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 Uh, regarding time, you still have 22 minutes, so you're good. Ah, okay. Okay. Thanks. Uh, all right. So, um, okay. We define this new state. So I'm going to rewrite the, um, the scattering amplitude. Instead of using momentum basis, I'm going to use this new boost eigenstate base, basis. Okay. Uh, so notice that uh, we have not touched uh, Z. So you know the angular dependence is still the same angular dependence that you had 
uh, for 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 the momentum basis amplitude, and uh, but we're exchanging now the energy. The energy now is being you know integrated over, and 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 and, and we are somehow we are exchanging the label of energy with this new label delta, which as as I uh, advertised will become the scaling dimension, our conformal dimension um, on, on the 2D CFT on the celestial sphere. Um, but let, let me get to that. Okay, so can okay, you see that, you know, right away uh, is that, um, um, you know, under Lorentz transformation, you do a Lorentz transformation on this, you know, just P, and then you see how omega and Z transform. And you see that this boost eigenstate under this Lorentz transformation transforms exactly as a conformal primary field with the scaling dimension delta. Okay. And um, so this is a good hint that you know you're heading uh, towards uh, a good direction. You're, 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 this is a good basis because it allows me to represent all this external state as primary fields on a 2D uh, CFT with with uh, with the scaling dimension um, delta. All right. Uh, let me let me just uh, uh, mention here that. Um, we're doing something, you know, um, which is very different from what we're used to, uh, in the sense that we're we're considering states in which we're integrating all all throughout the whole range of energies from the deep infrared to the uh, you know infinite uh, ultraviolet. So so that is something um, that is something new and special. Okay. So um, yeah, this is what I said. So we're exchanging the you know the label, the quantum label of energy for this new quantum label. Uh, uh, delta, uh, uh, which it is a scaling dimension. Pancho, I have a silly question. Uh, uh, yes, yes. Because this is gonna, this is gonna be your celestial uh, CFT, right? So, in the CFT that you're writing, uh, there is no time, right? So you have an Euclidean CFT, which might be non-unitarity. So I imagine that that delta by uh, will be a C number, right? Like a complex number. So. Could you really make that sum? Like that integration is possible to do, like uh, even if delta is not a real number. Yeah. So you're worried about yeah. You, but but you know there's um, I have I'm not really an expert on 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 those things. But this delta, as you said, it will become a, a complex number. But this is what it's called the principal series. So you still have a you, you, unitary description of the CFT. You have a you know, unitary CFT, but not just in the usual, um, uh, how is it called? When delta, I don't know if it, uh, what is the name, but, but you need to when delta the, is just a- huh? You need to define the dagger like differently. Or... Right, so uh, what was the name? It's a different from this usual construction of highest weight weight states. Okay. Yeah. So this is a principle, it's called the principal series in which you have a different set of, of states, but it's also unitary. And in, in order for it to be unitary, uh, you need this Delta to be equal to, and maybe I have it here, but uh, yeah, no, I, I did not put it. Um, this is forced in order to in order to have a unitary CFT. This is forced to have a real part equal to the dimension of the manifold. So in this case, it's two okay. divided by two. So the real part has to be equal to one. The imaginary part can be any real number. This is called the principal series. Okay. Now, if you had, for example, a, a CFT in in odd dimensions, so if it was a, instead of a two sphere, it would be a three sphere, which would be the case for I don't know maybe. Five dimensional bulk, maybe I'm not sure. But if you had an odd dimensional celestial sphere, then um, this is the, this delta. It's forced in order to have a unitary description. It's for to be a discrete number uh, plus some i. You know, I mean, the real part is forced to be a discrete number. So that's called the discrete series. Okay. But yeah, there there is. In principle, there's no problem with unitarity, at least from this point. One question, Francisco. Yes, yes. Is this really a boost eigenstate in the usual sense, or is it just a way of speaking? Because I don't see that in that transformation. So what's the particular case for a boost for A, B, C, and D? 
Well, mm -hmm. maybe yeah. The name is a, is loosely. I mean, the only the only reason it's called boost eigenstate is is because you're. So I have a state at a certain energy, then I add another state with slightly large energy, and then so on and so forth. You know, and in, in, in up to infinity. So you're summing up all this states which are okay. boosted with respect to each other and but, and they're really but they're really boosted but they also have, they, they all have the same z so they, they all go in the same you know direction correct. in the sky but when you apply a, bo a boost to that state is not proportional to itself necessarily or it doesn't look like that. yeah no you're right no it's not yeah you're right yes okay I don't know, did, did I answer the question or no? Well, you said no, it's not, so it's just a name. It's not really yeah. a negative state of a boost. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you're right, yeah. So I, I okay. have another question. Uh, yes, yes. The, right. So I, I understand that delta is, is basically the, the, the scaling dimension, but in, in order for, for the standard thing, right, like for you to define uh, like uh, conformal blocks and with a sort of descendants and all of that, uh, the delta has to have a discrete spectrum, right? Because you need to have a notion of like going in increments, right? So that you can, you can like, for instance, define uh, you know, like uh, like the, the block, right? So you start for, from the, from the par primary, and then you start like applying the derivative operator, and you get the descendants and, and so on, right? But if the if the delta is continuous, I mean, it, it, like, will this work in the same way? Like, would you be able to classify like into branches your states or or not? You see what I what I mean? Yeah, I'm I'm I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm not an expert, but I'm sure the answer is yes because mm -hmm. there are these papers by well, many people like uh, Abhijit Gade, I don't know if, if, if you know the name. Uh, there's mm -hmm. also papers by, you know, all these people who work in the CFT bootstrap, like um, mm -hmm. uh, this guy, this Israeli guy, the one with the A theorem. Uh, yeah, I know him, but I, I don't remember the... the, the Komar Gotsky. Komar Gotsky, yes, yes, Komar Gotsky. Thank you, Andy. Yes, and, and they, they, they talk about this, parallel description of a CFT in terms of this principle series in which delta is not, it's not, you know, a discrete, it doesn't have a discrete spectrum and uh -huh. it, it, it has exactly, so in two dimensions, it's forced to have real particle to one and a continuous uh, imaginary form. Yeah, but but of... I, I don't know much more about that. I, I only know that it's all kosher and, and, and sound, but the details I'm not very familiar with. In okay, thanks. But the, I mean, yeah, you would like to have a unitary CFT if you are studying CFT, right? But the main point of the whole thing is to study the this infinite symmetry algebra that appears in gravity, right? Like uh, you want to study this matrix in four dimensional Minkowski. So why to restrict this the CFT to be unitarity in principle? I mean, will it matter really? Because you will restrict more this matrix that you're computing, right? Yeah, maybe not. I mean, maybe you're right. I mean. Let me remind you that all these things are still in its infancy. People are just, you know, trying yeah. to uncover, you know, what's behind all these things. So you might be perfectly right that maybe unitarity on the CFT is not really necessary. Maybe you can, I mean, unitarity in the, in the, in the four dimensional sense, of course, we know that that has to be there. And if it, that is related to unitarity on the CFT, maybe not, maybe yeah. there's another way of seeing it. So. You might be completely right, yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, keep going. Okay, uh, I'm sorry, but I, I was sketching this slide and then I forgot to, 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 to write it you know, nicely. Um, but the information is there. So, um, you know, massless states like gravitons and photons and gluons, of course, the quantum numbers that they have uh, um, in terms of, you know, um, you know, the, the spin quantum numbers, actually they have helicity. Helicity is the, is, the, is the correct number, the quantum number. You can have, you know, a gluon with helicity plus one or minus one or, or, or a graviton with helicity. 
plus plus one or plus minus or minus one, you know, so it's been two, so they're more combinations, but it's just a discrete number uh, which takes values either one or two, I'm sorry, one or minus one. So um, what, what the, the mapping of these quantum numbers in the four, in the, in, of, of the four dimensional theory, the helicities get mapped to the spin of the conformal primary. Uh, so the, 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 they match precisely. The energy uh, uh, was being exchanged by this new conformal dimensional conformal dimension, and and uh, but but you know the z and the z bar uh, directions are 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 on, are the same. All right, so we seem to have concrete realization, or or some of uh, you know uh, somehow a concrete realization of this formal symmetry on the celestial sphere and the own symmetry of the four uh, dimensional space time bulk. But this actually gets even more concrete. Um, if, it, for example, if you use the LS, the LSZ formula to write down, you know, um, scattering amplitudes in momentum space, you realize that uh, that after this Mellin transformation onto, you know, when you sum up all the energies of all the external states with this special, you know, weights uh, related uh, that that has, you know, this conformal dimension uh, built in in it. If you do this Mellin uh, transfer onto, onto the, uh, the full amplitude, you will get exactly a two-dimensional correlation function uh, in a CFP, um, uh, which, uh, in, in which the points on, on, you know, on, on the CFT are just the, uh, you know, the directions in the night sky or the net directions on the, on the celestial sphere. So, so we really do uh, have now this, this direct map between 4D collisions and a 2D CFT correlation function. So, and, and, and this, ob I'm sorry, and this object over here, it's what it's now being called a celestial amplitude. So let me talk about this object here now, celestial amplitude. So um, just repeating myself here. So in general, scattering amplitude has this. Okay, so you do this, I'm not just repeating, okay. Uh, so if you do this, this, this um, uh, integration over all the or energies of all the n external particles, and you end up with this. And this was done by Pastersky, Sean, and Strominger in 2017. All right. Um, so um, yeah, I'm sorry. This is repeated slides. The slide. Um, it's the same thing. Right, so now uh, the first thing that you should check, for example, is you know under a four-dimensional Lorentz transformation, which we know that now it, it's uh, you know it's mapped to this uh, SL2C transformations on 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 the sphere. Then do your amplitudes transform covariantly under you know uh, the Moebius group, and it's exactly what it what what happens. You know, so if 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 I transform you know, the celestial amplitude, the celestial correlators, I change all the Zs by a, by a Moebius transformation, and you get exactly um, uh, the, uh, the factor that, um, you know, that comes out in, uh, for, for conformal transformations on, the, on, on a 2D CFT. Um, and, and, and moreover, uh, you know, um, um, it comes out exactly with the, with, with the correct formal weights um, in which, uh, this is scaling dimension, I forgot to write it here, has to be equal to one plus i times any real number, okay? Uh, so it, it really is a label because, you know, it's parameterized by just the real line, but uh, the real part is it's equal to one, but the, the imaginary part is equal to just any number. And the GIs are, are, are really the two, I mean, are, are the two D spins of this primary um, fields, they, match precisely with, uh, with the helicities of the four-dimensional theory. I'll, I will show you an example of this in, in, in a few moments. So, um, yeah. Okay, so um, yeah, I, I, I keep writing the same thing all over and over, okay? So we have this new holographic description and, and, and I wanted to um, also, um, Note here that remember that we're summing over all the all, all, all the energies to arbitrarily, you know, large energies. So it really combines the celestial amplitudes combine 
or they force us to think about you know the infrared and the UV in a more in a unified way. We're forced to do this. Um, and I will show you right away why um, or, or how. Okay, so for example, let me just give you an example, uh, a very concrete example. So we have a three level four gluon amplitude, you know, in, in four space time dimensions. So uh, writing, you know, uh, the momenta, the external momenta uh, using, uh, using this omega and, and disease uh, parameterization, actually all the omega dependence goes away. In this case, where you have, you know, one gluon with minus helicity, another gluon with minus helicity, and, and what comes out uh, are two gluons with opposite helicities. This is called MHV, maximum, it's, it's just the name for maximal helicity violation amplitude. Uh, they, they are very simple because it's not a sum of, you know, horrendous number of terms. Um, they're very easy to deal with. Um, so in, in this coordinates, it looks like this. Notice that all the uh, omega dependence go, went away. Um, and then you do this Mellin transform, and then you get exactly a four point uh, to DC T correlation function with the correct uh, with the correct formal weights. Moreover, uh, if you if you check if you do this uh, this you know explicit computation, you will see that J one and J two are exactly minus one. These were the elicities of the uh, you know uh, gluons coming in, and J three and J four are they, they also have the exact same helicities at the outgoing. Uh, gluons, okay, um, and, and of course, if you do this for any amplitude that you want, uh, this will always be true. I mean, the matching between the helicities and, and, and the spin, the conformal spins. Uh, um, one more thing that, um, nice thing is that, for example, this R thing here, no, notice that this is the, the, the thing that transforms covariantly. Uh, under under conformal transformations uh, in two dimensions, you have this formally invariant factor, and this conformally invariant factor is a function of this uh, formal ratios, which I did not put them here, but it's just a, it's it's a conformal ratio. And the nice thing also is that it's related to something very physical on on four dimensions. Uh, so this R is actually minus. Mandelstam variable s divided by t, but the very physical thing is that this ratio here uh, uh, is, is, is a direct measure of the scattering angle in the center of mass frame. So, so you can study, for, if you want to study, for example, forward scattering or hard scattering, uh, you should take different limits on, 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 on this r, on this um, um, celestial um, correlate. Okay, uh, I have 10 minutes, right, uh, Felipe, or less? Oh, yeah, 10 minutes, okay, because we have a scallop. Okay, 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 okay. I'll, I'll, I'll try to go fast. So let me give you another example of gravitons, okay? So notice, notice, remember, look, notice this. Uh, let me go back to the gluon amplitude. All, all the omega dependence uh, uh, went away. Um, when you do, for example, other amplitudes like in QED or things like that, you have omegas maybe in the denominator. So when you integrate over omega, notice that it, this also has a real part. You have to be careful because if this amplitude here has too many omegas in the, uh, or too many energy dependence in the numerator, this integral is going to blow up in the ultraviolet. And this is exactly what happens with graviton amplitudes, even at three level. So in momentum space, you know, everybody knows that of course uh, gravity, just pure gravity is not renormalizable. At one loop it is renormalizable, you can do it, but you know, if you do two loop, three loop, then, then, then things get out of control. But at least three level amplitudes in gravity are completely under control. Nothing diverges, of course, because you're not summing up over any energies at three level. Uh, but when you do this celestial amplitudes, um, then things go south because, uh, uh, look, it has too many powers of omega, and when you and, and, and you do uh, in the in the numerator, and when you do this Mellin transform, it actually blows up. Okay, so graviton amplitudes have problems even at three level. So this is what I was trying to to say at the beginning. Like the celestial amplitude, it's forcing us to talk about some uh, uh, when, when you involve gravity, is forcing us to talk about theories 
which makes sense in the UV. So this blowing up of things actually, uh, as I said, happens for all gravitational amplitudes in field theory, okay? Um, so this happens for all gravitational amplitudes except in the string theory, actually. In the string theory, at very high energies, actually the amplitude is exponentially soft. And this exponential, you know, uh, is able to soften any power behavior that you can have in your graviton amplitude. So this guarantees that, uh, that celestial amplitude or celestial correlators associated with gra gravitational amplitudes for graviton amplitudes in the string theory are completely safe, even at tree level, okay? even at tree level. Uh, but I don't want to focus only on the string theory. Uh, this also happens, for example, when you have transplancan energy scattering. So for example, if you have two to two graviton scattering in, and if you go to the very high energy limit, you have you know, some things here that dominate at low energy, but at high energy, uh, uh, this term here has become about the one and this uh, other term here become suppressed. This is exactly the black hole entropy, the Bekenstein-Hawking uh, entropy of a black hole. And this goes like, you know, like a power law to omega squared, but notice the minus sign. So transplanting energy, when you have a scattering at very, very high energies, because of black hole formation, because, you know, when you're scattering particles at higher and higher energies, they form a black hole. And then the out state will be just the Hawking radiation, which is extremely soft precisely because of this factor here. So at extremely high energies, gravitational amplitudes become, you know, good behaved again. So this is something to keep in mind. Um, um, nobody has worked on this, on, on, on this kind of things yet from the point of view of celestial amplitudes. Um, I would love to get involved on, on, on those kind of things, but of course time is limited. But this is something very, very, very important to, to, to look at and, and, and very exciting also. So, um, yeah, so if somebody wants to talk about these things, it would be really nice. Okay. Uh, let me talk about now infrared divergences. So at loop level, uh, uh, of course, you have all these divergences that start to appear uh, because of the loop integration. Now, in, in field theory, at least in, in renormalizable theories, we know exactly what to do with UV divergences. They, they, uh, you do renormalization, you know, this Wilsonian um, at, um, paradigm, and, and, and then, you know, you, all these infinities that, that appear in the UV are, 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 you know, are somehow absorbed into renormalizations of, 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 the, of the physical, of the physical um, parameters that you actually see in the experiments. But infrared divergences actually are nastier than that. I mean, they, they, there's no way, I mean, there, there isn't yet a good understanding of uh, infrared divergences. So usually if you read, you know, um, uh, Weinberg's uh, Rest in Peace uh, textbook uh, or, you know, any, any QFT textbook, uh, how you deal with infrared divergences, the answer is it's, it's always ugly in the sense that at the end of the day, it always boils down to, yeah, well, you have some photon which is, you know, extremely low energy or it has some very, uh, I call it, uh, it's collinear with some particle. So this angle, you can only resolve it because, I mean, you, 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 you're not able to resolve infinite, infinitesimally small angles because the calorimeter at the particle accelerator is not able to resolve, you know, you know angles is more than a certain cutoff. So there's a built-in cutoff in the experiments when you measure physical quantities like a cross section or things like that. But from the point of view, physical, you know, theoretical physics, that's, that is not really satisfactory. So there should be a way of, and these are not my words, of course, these are words, you know, like people like Strominger and, and you know, even Weinberg was, was saying these things uh, a long time ago. There should be a way of dealing with infrared divergences at the level of the amplitude, um, even before you know, computing uh, physical observables like you know, like like cross sections and things like that. Okay, so um, what is the nice thing about massless scattering? Again, and again, when I'm saying massless scattering, I'm not saying that I only have massless particles in the spectrum. I can have quarks and gluons and and and, and electrons, and, you know, Higgs and and, and everything. 
uh, which is massive, but I'm focusing on out in, in the uh, external states, which are gluons or gravitons, for example. Okay? So um, um, in that case, uh, a very nice result is that um, you do the whole loop resummation of all infrared divergences, they actually exponentiate gauge theory in any gauge theory. And, um, and they exponentiate and, 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 and even more, they factorize. So all of the infrared divergence is contained in this factor over here, uh, which is called the anomalous, uh, I mean, the soft anomalous dimension uh, factor. Uh, this is called the soft anomalous dimension matrix. In the case of QED, when you have an abelian theory, for example, this is just a number. In the case of QCD or any non-abelian theory, like Young Mills, this becomes a matrix. So it's, it's very hard to, to, to work with these things. Um, and, and because it's a matrix, uh, uh, the, this path ordering uh, operator appears here because you need to be able to deal with you know, the ambiguity of, of how you integrate a matrix with different values of, of, of this um, lambda here. Okay? But I, I don't want to get into so many details. Uh, let me just tell you that um, uh, yeah, in momentum space, this, this, this thing uh, has been known for a few years. And then you have this finite part, which is infrared safe. So this is the thing that has the information about the physical processes that you see, you know, at the LHC or whatever. And, 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 and this has valuable information about all the quantum mechanical things going on, going on, you know, at very, very low energies. This PIPJ are just uh, the kinematical invariance for the I particle and the J particle. And, okay. So question. How does this factorization look like for the 2D CFT correlator? So for 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 um, celestial amplitude, let me let, let me remind you that, or maybe did not say before. So momentum space amplitudes, I'm just denoting them by a, and, and celestial amplitude, I'm putting a tilde on. So since we have this factorization in momentum space, and now I do a Mellin transform. Let me go back again. I do a Mellin transform over this thing here. Normally, normally, you don't expect that the Mellin transform of a product of two functions be the product of the two Mellin transforms individually, right? Just like in Fourier transform, the Fourier transform of the product is not the product of the Fourier transforms. But it happens that for, for celestial amplitude, this is indeed the case. You again have this factorization, and you again have this thing which is completely finite. And, um, and um, what the effect of the all the infrared divergences of this cloud of infrared photons and gravitons or whatever, uh, what it does onto the finite part, the celestial amplitude, the only thing that does is to shift the conformal dimension an infinite amount. We regard this now as just a renormalized conformal dimension. So this is again a finite thing after renormalization, right? So. Um, this was done by, uh, uh, for a case of massless QED and graviton amplitudes um, uh, uh, by Arkane Hamed, Pate, Rakariu, Strominger in 2020 uh, with uh, Hernan and Andrea. Uh, we, we did it for the case of N equals four Supreme Mills in the planar limit um, uh, also last year. And, 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 and for the case of, of, of just pure QCD, just real world QCD, uh, um, uh, we did it with, with a nun uh, just in April this year. Um, let me just tell you a few more things. I mean, uh, notice that this Z factor in momentum space was a function of this Mandelstam, uh, you know, invariance, of Lorentz invariant, uh, uh, you know, functions built out of, you know, just the uh, external momenta. This gets mapped into just this thing over here. I, I forgot, this, this shouldn't be a comma here. It's supposed to be just uh, times, okay, just a product. Uh, so this gets mapped onto uh, this mu that has units of energy, uh, also that has to do with the scale of renormalization. Um, but the nice thing is that, you know, Lorentz invariants become distances on the celestial sphere. Okay, so it's the distance between this zi and zj point. Actually, on the on the projective, you know, uh, uh, plane, uh, the uh, you know the, the stereographic projection. But let me just show it like that. Okay. Um, so that's one nice uh, uh, thing about celestial amplitudes. Um, 
So this thing here, since it has all the information about the infrared part, is actually univer universal. This is process dependent. This is going to depend whether you're scattering you know, gravitons or gluons or three gluons or four gluons, you know, a loop, whatever. Um, but this factor here is actually universal. So since it's universal and we're looking for some unifying picture of, of for the physics in terms of this 2D CFT on the celestial sphere, this is a very good candidate to study uh, in, order, in order to find you know, universal structure of this still hidden CFT. We, we don't know what it is yet. Uh, so, um, Felipe, me pasé. Yeah, that's, uh, okay. that's okay, we, because we, have, we asked in the middle, so. Can I have like three or five more minutes? Yeah, three minutes. Three. Okay, okay, three minutes, okay. So um, in the large and limit, um, um, uh, with a man, uh, uh, we, we, we obtained that uh, actually this, the, the thing that describes this, this, this thing here, it's actually a theory on the 2D sphere, uh, which is just a free two-dimensional scalar field but with color indices, with, with non-abelian color indices. Um, uh, Lorenzo Magna, uh also just weeks before us, he, uh, he already found, he also found that, that um, even at finite end, you, uh, even at finite end, but the praise that you pay is that uh, we did it are all loops, okay? But uh, Magnia, uh, uh, for finite end, but if you just uh, keep terms up to two loops, uh, it's also described by a colored scalar field um, um, on, on, on the 2D CFP. All right, uh, so moreover, uh, um, we found that, that the Z could be described in terms of just a correlation function of some vertex operators uh, in which these are just primary vertex operators with infrared divergent weights. I'm sorry that I have to go too fast. Let me get to the, to the final point. Um, but in the large and limit, this correlation function, because it becomes exactly the correlation function that you find in the Coulomb gas description, you have a free boson but in this case, with the color index. So usually the free boson has not, you know, have any non-abelian structure, but here the addition is, is just very mild. You just put, uh, you know, a color index on, on, onto this, onto this uh, scalar fields, then you can reproduce the complete, uh, you know, soft part of the celestial amplitude as just a correlation function on its own. Um, Disculpen, es que le pasó algo a mi guagua. Espérenme un poco, perdón. ¿Está bien? Es que disculpen, es que mi guagua empezó a ahogarse y, y pero mi, mi, mi esposa la la vio está bien. Es ok. More important than physics. <laughs> yeah, just you can start conclude. Okay, 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 so I, I will conclude now. And uh, so, so we have this, this vertex operator in which, you know, this, this correlation function of this vertex operator reproduces this thing. So we have this effective action of, 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 on, on the 2D CFT, just a, a free color scalar. Um, um, uh, there's uh, one more thing here that uh, this is just ne nearest neighbor interactions. Uh, this actually, it's, uh, it was uh, something that it comes from the large and limit where, okay, I, we can, you can ask me about this later. Um, um, the last thing is that, okay, we were in the large and limit. So what if you do this, you know, one over N expansion? So what happens with uh, one over N corrections? So this is something which is, is, we're still working out. We're not sure, but it seems like there's a Western Mino Witten model emerging from, from, from this thing here. And the reason is if you just take this thing here and, and then uh, uh, which is in, in the at finite end truncated to two loops, only truncated to two loops, just like in the case of Lorenzo Magnier that I was telling you about before, um, uh, it has this form here, the path ordering you know, goes away after two loops, and there's nothing there. Um, and then you, you compute you know, the derivative of this thing with respect to one of the z's, you see that at, at leading order in n, this is exactly the Nishnik cosmological equation that you know, this consistency equation in, that appears in the, in the Western Minowitan models. So um, 
but actually there's a little caveat here because this thing becomes actually a little bit trivial does not have the full non-abelian structure of the western minoritan model um, so we're not entirely sure that this is actually true uh, but okay we have to see it and then also the the next question of course is to to see what happens with all these subleading terms um is there some you know more uh, uh you know a deeper cft a more complicated cft behind all this um we don't know yet so this is the, with this i finished so there seems to be this new kind of holography for the amplitudes in terms of 2d cft correlated functions of the traverses here um what about full physics in 4d is that is still a, a, a 2d cft on celestial sphere uh we don't know yet and uh, let me just finish by saying that this is all in, in in its infancy still so thank you very much sorry that i went uh over over time okay thank, thank you bunch no it's okay we ask a lot so is there any question from the audience? You can just unmute yourself. Ignacio? Yeah, I have a small question. Um, so I, I like this point that, that you made, Francisco, that uh, like for, for in, the, in the UV, like for UV divergences, you can actually say that they, they are uh, like naturally like regularized simply because when, when you have very energetic particles, you don't have particles, you have black holes, right? So that at the end of the day, the, the scattering will also will always come, like the final states will always come from the Hawking radiation. But you can yes. make that point. I mean, I, ha I have never heard that claim, but I imagine that you can say it not only for graviton scattering, you can say it for anything, like, because uh, anything that is transplanted will no longer be the thing that you thought it was, but will actually yeah, yeah, yeah. Black, it will actually be a black hole. So, so in, in this sense, it's like, you don't even need renormalization anymore for any CFT or for any QFT in general, because uh, it will always be naturally regularized simply because at high energies, you no longer have particles. The only thing that you have are black holes. So, yes. so of course, the final states will always be uh, like the scattering to, to the final state will, will always be soft because it will come from Hawking radiation. But, but, exactly. what, but, but what about it? I mean, that's it's yeah, just yeah, I, know it's, I mean you just made this point or or there is some calculation no 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 this, yeah this is not this is not my idea for the yeah. no but i mean um i so these are this these are things that people like you know uh arcani hamed and stominger are, are are like emphasizing in this past few months but i i believe these are also not their original ideas i think people like Toft were saying these things already or in the 90s and susking but there, there, there wasn't, I mean, okay, the, it seems more heuristic than we have the technology to do something about it uh, yet. I mean, uh, it seems true, as you just said, uh, it seems very, you know, uh, uh, solid, but um, I don't think there are many calculations to, to, to support, you know, the idea, except some Two to two scattering for for gravity or, but but yeah, I mean it seems very important and it seems that to be things that people are emphasizing lately. But right, it's like again, saying it, it, it's like saying you shouldn't even worry about UV divergences in any quantum field theory because it for sounds true, yeah I, because in the in the truly transplanted regime you don't have particles anymore. The only thing that you have is black hole scattering. I mean, yeah, so, I also read like, that okay, way. I, I mean, I also I also read it the same way as you. It you right. know it seems it sounds huge, but you know I'm a little bit hesitant to say any more about it because I have not seen people to talk about much about this. Right. So there might be some details that that you know that spoil everything. But in principle, it sounds kosher. But yeah, I don't know. Right. But but then the the, the theory that you propose. I mean, the, the, sorry that that you're talking about this. Uh... Celestial sphere scattering, it actually doesn't say anything about that, right? You just said it as a like as a comment or or I mean did, did, did you actually do something along this line? Sorry that I, I not... fixed on this particular idea because I, no, no, I no, but it yeah, seems it, super it, interesting to me because it, it's yeah, the yeah. first time that I have heard such a thing. Like really Yeah, yeah. No, the, uh, as I said, there aren't may, there are any any papers on on black hole scattering or you know, formation of black hole from the point of view of celestial sphere, you know, CFT. Okay. There's nothing. If I mean, if you want to look at that, and, and, and let's 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 you know meet and, and, and talk because it seems really 
I mean, you know, really shocking, yeah. Is there any other question from the audience? Well, if not, I have a question. Well, it's silly, really, but uh, if you do like, because now you have primary fields, right? And you have the conformal weights. Uh, you could do like the uh, the algebra by by seeing the OPEs, like uh, divergences, right? So like the poles on the OPEs, then you can read like yes. the, the algebra of it. Yes, uh, yes, yes. Yes, but now you can, you can start from the amplitudes and end up uh, there and I think that at the level of at, at three level has been done by Strominger and Guevara, but yes. but you with with your result on the amplitude you have to all orders right like you have you have some formula for could you do could do do you expect a correction on the algebra like a cat Moody level enhancement or something if you do the algebra from this new amplitude that you propose or how will it affect the symmetry algebra or on the CFT side. Yeah, we thought about this with Hernan and Andrea a long time ago. Um, you do... Well, the answer is that I'm not sure. I, I remember that Hernan ran into Strominger in Valdivia and, and asked them about, you know, loop corrections to this OPE uh, uh, stuff that he was doing with, with Alfredo Guevara. Yeah. And if I remember correctly, I think Strominger said, said something that this is, you know, exact what they were doing. Uh, they do three level. I mean, they were doing three level, but he was saying something about being exact for for a reason I don't know. Uh, <laughs> because yeah, I don't know the answer. I mean, may, may, maybe it does have corrections. Yeah, maybe it because, doesn't. But yeah, yeah, it is because you, you were mentioning West Mino Witten models, and if you do West Mino Witten four model when you couple the current with this gauge connection, um, oh, what's sorry, there's a, a story on. I don't remember now. Uh, yeah, if you do like West Mino Witten four, you can match a three level with the twisted holography of this algebra, which is this Kevin Costello program for holography, and um, mm -hmm. also matches with the algebra of Guevara, Strong and Pate on this year. <laughs> but in the, in the twisted holography side, when you do like uh, loop corrections or subleading correction, the algebra is no longer a Lie algebra, okay? But it's a quantum group, so it has corrections. So I don't know. I was expecting some. Uh, so. I'm, I'm I'm sure I'm sure that you know there aren't there are there there, there are many works on 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 this on, from the celestial point of view. So it's also very interesting to look at. Yeah. Um, so you're saying you're saying that the loop corrections matches with uh, no no not the, the loop corrections extensions of like the cast Moody at three levels the Westmino Witten four celestial holography matches with the ones of twisted holography and also matches with the one of Guevara and Strominger. Uh, but, but is it it's cast Moody right? Yeah yeah cast Moody. But if if you go to the subleading corrections in the twisted holography side, you can you will obtain an algebra which is not a Lie algebra, but it's a quantum group algebra. Which is a little bit more subtle, like young end or this young back. Ah. So uh, I I wanted to know if there is something like from the West Sumino with them celestial holography. Like. So this is subleading in what? In what parameter from this twister stuff? Uh, I don't remember because I have I, I think that there is not even a paper on this because I watch a string conference. And disappear, and the papers should appear. So we have to read it when it appears. But I remember that they were commenting on. Uh, our okay. Probably it's true. But... Because you know what? Uh, what we were seeing with Hernan, but but again, we have to look at it again because it was a long time ago. Was that this niche need comes some logical thing that appears in the Western Mino Witten models? Uh, this thing here, you see, and you know, the, uh, the, the level, the level of the West Sumino width and proportional to N. So okay. it, it's like, so in the larger limit, we are, you know, in the large K, large level okay. limit. Okay, okay. So if you do, you know, one over level corrections, it, it maybe it matches with, you know, one over N corrections or things like that. 
So yeah, maybe we can talk about this. It also, you know, sounds interesting. Yeah, but according to Strominger, should be zero like at all orders, right? Yeah, but again, I don't know what he was referring to. Maybe, I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe there are some, you know, parts of his calculation that does that do receive corrections, loop corrections, and maybe some others don't. I mean, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm. I'm not sure. Uh, let's talk to Anand about this because I, I, he he's the one who 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 yeah, talked about I'm, this. I'm asking out of ignorance. So, is there any other questions from the audience? I have one last question, maybe very short. So it may be naive, but I, it's something that I cannot imagine. What happens when you have in the bulk a scattering that happens entirely in the direction of the line of sight? Like, how does that get projected into the celestial sphere? So you're saying that the particles become collinear? Right. Yeah, so the, uh, that has to do with the OPE. Uh, so it's... So no, notice this, notice this, or, or maybe even even just the gloom case, which is less pathological. You see, for example, when the particles go, you know, in the line of sight, then Z1 goes to Z2. Yeah. Forgot to mention that this is Z1 minus Z2. Mm -hmm. uh, so when they right, go it's together, like the, it's like the, the, the contact term is, is blowing up essentially, but but that is in the in the in the dualized description, like in the description of the celestial CFT, but but in the in your original uh, bulk theory, it they 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 call the I mean the particles are at different points. So so yeah, so I, I don't understand this. You but you're saying that the particles become collinear or not? Uh, right. That I mean that the, the interaction happens at the line of sight. Uh, like for instance, imagine okay, you have like a like a scattering. That has that happens along the line, line of sight, and the particles, for instance, rebound in opposite directions, but always at the line of sight. Yeah, so this is the forward limit. It's called the forward limit, uh -huh. right? When the scattering angle goes to zero. Uh -huh. Right? Is it so? So in that case, you will have to study, you know, on the CFT the limit when 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 these things, you know, go to zero. Okay. And so people like also Strominger and 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 and, and Steberger and Taylor, I think also, uh, what what they 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 have done is that these singularities that appear because of this collinearity and the bulk, they become you know the the the, the terms in the OPE when you 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 know when you when you go also to to when Z one goes to Z two on, on on the CFT correlation function. I don't know if that answers your question. I think so. Maybe I'm confused. I, I was just thinking that because you have this kind of projection in 2D at the celestial sphere, you have more divergences. I mean, you can have more divergences that you wouldn't have in your usual amplitudes in the bulk. Because in the in the bulk, if you have a like a scattering process that happens all along the same line, like a, along the same line of sight, uh, it will not be a singular process in the bulk. But it will be mapped to a singular amplitude in the in the celestial sphere simply because it would look as if the contact term is blowing up in the, from the description in terms of the two D CFT. But but from the point of view of the bulk, it it will not be singular. How do you know it will not be singular from the point of view of the bulk? Because I mean it's perfectly fine. I mean like like for instance you can have a, a scattering process like a usual one where you have like a, I don't know like two particles that, that interact and they rebound, but along the same line, along the same direction. Yeah, you're saying, you're saying like, you know, a head-on collision of proton, the LHC, proton, proton, something like this. Right, and then they and rebound. Then they bounce but, like that. Right. But, and, and all of that is oriented along the line of sight. Ah, but in the CFT, they will go to antipodal points at the end, right? That's true also, yes. Ah, okay. So, so they they will not be coincident actually, because they will be in antipodal points. Yeah, it looks like it. Yeah, I have not thought about this, but yeah. Right. No, but but you you know what I mean, right? Because it's like everything that that occurs along the same line of sight will get projected to the same z coordinate in the two D in the celestial sphere. So, I maybe I was thinking that maybe. You have more divergences in the 2D CFT description 
than the ones that you would get in the usual scattering description in the 4D boat, just because of this projection. Yeah, but yeah, maybe yeah. No, not, yeah, I, but, I understand. But, but maybe, maybe not, because if, if this happens, actually, the, in the celestial sphere, the final states will be at antipodal points. So it is the same line of sight, but in opposite direction. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Maybe, so maybe it's okay. I, I was just wondering about this. You, 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 so, you understand what I mean, right? Yeah, 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 I understand. So, uh, so you're saying in the, in, the, in the correlation function, if you have one Z going to the, its antipodal map, it does not blow up, right? That's what you're saying also? I, I don't know. I think it doesn't blow up, right? I, I was worried that you have more possibility for divergences that at the CFT because you have yeah, this projection. It, it, it doesn't actually, yeah. Uh. It might actually go to zero because, you know, the antipodal map for, so Z and its antipode is minus one over Z. So things that blow up in the denominator actually make it zero because it goes into the numerator. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it seems that it doesn't not blow up. Yeah. Okay. So now, then, then it's not the pathological. Okay. Right. I yeah. was just wondering about this. Right. Yeah. Thanks. But now I wonder if it's actually make it zero. <laughs> uh, so we have a last question from Per, but Per, please keep it short. I was just going. I'm sorry. I joined very late. It's very naive. <laughs> also, I mean, this vertex. You have this vertex operator algebra. You have a CFT. So the, what states do you have? What's the, the perturbative spectrum of that CFT? Is that supposed to be gluons or do you have additional states in the theory? I see, for example, this J is where plus and minus one there for gluons. Yeah, but yeah. If this... take higher spin, uh, is there precise, should I, are you describing just pure young needles or are you at some point adding additional degrees of freedom coming from? No, the uh, no I mean, um, so, yeah, maybe this was at the beginning. Uh, so when when you do this this uh, this mapping between uh, you know the states and you go to these different bases, this melting bases or the the, mm -hmm. the boost eigenstate bases, then um, the this new this new states that live on the sphere, uh, they behave like uh, primary fields. Mm -hmm. So, so for example, the helicity of the gluons or the helicity of the gravitons become the the, the conformal spin of these primaries. Right. Yeah. And, and and also and 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 you know if they have color indices, they become a scalar index on the scalar field that represents this 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 field. Right. Right. Yeah. But that and that is in the large and limited in some approximation. Maybe you know when you have the full-fledged uh, non-abelian structure, maybe more things show up. But but in principle, it seems to be just that. Yeah, some color in this index on 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 the um, on the primary field. Man, I equate because usually one doesn't put the bound on the scaling dimensions in a two-dimensional CFT. You have to allow delta greater than two. So you would have to include higher spin particles, for example. But this is this is the uh, this is an uh, uh, it's called the principal series description of the CFT. So this delta is not forced to satisfy um, this, the usual constraints when you when you have this when you when you have this higher what is it? Uh, uh, when you use the ladder operator to you, you know to to build the entire spectrum. It's a different construction. Uh, in which these deltas here are, are, are different and they're forced to have real particle to one and arbitrary marginal part. Okay, so that, that comes to you had the de, J downstairs, the delta, so it's forced to be one, you say, plus or minus one, and then you're going to have imaginary part. Uh -huh. I mean, the, the, the delta, the delta, the real part is forced to be equal to one. This is because you want normalizable states under some norm. So I did not mention it here, but just like, for example, in, in plane waves, uh, they're, not normal, they're not normalizable, of course, but they're, they're, you know, they're normalizable some, uh, under some you know, in, uh, uh, inner product. So here, if you normalize this, this boost angle state with the Klein-Gordon norm, then the fact of them being normalizable forces you to this delta, let me, let me 
this delta is forced to be one plus i than any other number, uh, so some real number. This y is actually because this is what's called the principal series. It's actually d minus two divided by two. So the celestial sphere, uh, I mean, number 14. Yeah. It's, it's to take one principal series. It's called the principal series, yes. I, for, I, I forgot to mention that, yes, exactly that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You're okay. not writing four point functions and reading off intermediate states with different values of delta or anything. Say that again, say that again. Endless fields in the bulk or anything. No, you're not forced to do that. I mean, right? In S matrix, you should be able to factorize over one particle states or multi particle states. So you don't do that. Because then. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure I understood. But can, your can four you, point, can you say? Yeah, your four point function for gluons, if you factorize that one, try to explain the two vertex operators in, two out, then you do the OPE. Shouldn't I naively, I would expect, you know, some infinite number of operators contributing and mixing in there and with different values of delta, not necessarily principal series. And in that case, it's complete only when you add all of these particles to your spectrum. This is a naive question. I mean, this is how a string theory is, right? You scatter four tachyons and you factorize the oops, I have gravitons and massive higher spin particles on all the regular trajectories appearing, right? So right, but in that in, in that case you have an infinite tower of massive states, which are the ones you know that are, you know, yeah, it's yeah. the reason why you have all this infinite, you know, uh, you know, higher spin states in the, in in between. In, yeah. in between the external yeah. states. But in this case, in this case, at least for now, the spectrum is the cardinality of the spectrum seems to be the same. You have, you know, just you know, gluon states and the, you know, mm -hmm. no, right? That uh, this is the claim, right? But that that seems is that natural? You think? I mean, how should I think of that as being natural? If I'm a naive, poor string theorist or you know, safety person, I mean, usually you factorize, you know, right? You draw four external legs and you have some intermediate states, and typically that's the nice thing you should have. CFT that you, you, you can understand the spectrum of the theory and there will be a large number of states exchanged in there. So, so why does that not happen here? I mean, uh, we can discuss uh, I, I will. Yeah, if you guys can discuss it later on. Yeah, yeah. That maybe yeah okay, okay, okay. But yeah, sorry, but I don't have a clear answer, but I think people have done, have, anal have analyzed this, this yeah, question. Yeah, that's understand, of course. It's just that my, my yeah. I'm yeah, yeah, and, and and I don't know the answer also. So sorry about that. Yeah, okay. So let's thank thanks Pancho uh, one more time for his <laughs> attempt to try to quantize gravity. <laughs> so thank you, Pancho, <laughs> for the nice talk, and thank you all guys for being here. It's nice to see such a big crowd. So next week we have Rodrigo Lea talking on. I don't know. He hasn't sent the title. So, but next week at the same time. So see you guys. Thank you very much.